seeing you tomorrow. If you have your Bible, would you please open with me to Colossians chapter 3. Now, this will be our last week in Colossians for now. And I know you've just pulled up and you say, hey, wait a minute, we have a lot of work to do still before the end of the book. I'm not going to take it all today, I promise. Um, but we are going to be breaking because next week is the first Sunday of Advent. And so we will do a, a series through the book, uh, or su- through Advent, and then we're going to take a few weeks in the new year just to recenter us. I, I think there's a, a couple things that, that we just need to get right so we can move forward well. And then from there, we're going to um, just pick up in the book of Colossians again in February. So this will not be the end of our time here. And you'll notice today as we stop, it's right before some of the good stuff that I'm sure you're wanting to know about, like marriage and relationships and parenting. And so when we pick that back up in the spring, that'll be a time for us to dive into some of those issues a little more in depth and also outside of the Sunday morning context as well together. So... Colossians chapter 3, we'll be in verse 5 as our start today, and we'll roll through 17. And if you were here last week and you're worried, I promise I will not talk about sex this morning. So, (laughs) there you go. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. Father, we are so grateful for your word that you allow us the opportunity to sit in it every week. That you allow us the opportunity to hear from your word and, and as we hear from your word the good news of Christ, we thank you that you invite us to follow those words. Lord, I, I know that the temptation for us when we come to texts like this is to run from it because it's uncomfortable and contrary to our nature. But Lord, we thank you for giving us a new self, for creating a new community, a people that is now identified by the blood of Jesus. And Lord, so we just thank you that as you've created that community, you have also set out in your word a compelling vision for what that community is to look like. I pray that we would respond to your word this morning. That we would not just be hearers, but that we would be doers. We love you, Lord. It is a joy to be a part of your church. In your name we pray, amen. 
As we come to this text, I think it's important to go back just a little bit to grab some context for us. A couple weeks ago, we made this note that in verse 20 of chapter two and in verse one, we see Paul begin to step into a section of scripture where he's doing things uh, a little differently. And what I mean by that is he starts in verse 20 with this thought, if you died. And then in verse one, we see, if you have been raised with Christ. And then here we see in verse five, and then again in verse 12, two thoughts that bring us in contrast, but also building off of verses 20 and verse one, which is put to death, therefore, put on. That is gonna be a a guiding tool for us as we work through this passage. Uh, One of the things I think we have to know, and we noted a few weeks ago, is that for those of us in Christ, for those of, of us who have believed in Christ, have turned to him, Jesus as Lord, when he died, we died. When he was raised from the dead, we were. And the way that Paul talks about that and what is happening in the moment of Christ dying is that we are so united to Christ the ruling and reigning king of the universe, that what's true about us is made most clear in what is true about Jesus. And so Paul goes into verses one through four with this invitation for us. Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And we made an observation here that I think is important. Many people will read this text and they'll walk away with that. Yes, it's so good to just reflect upon the heavens all day and I don't have to think about the circumstantial before me. I'm just gonna reflect on the heavens. And so we become so earthly minded that we are no earthly good, but that's not what Paul's inviting us into here. When he says those words, seek the things that are above, he is inviting us and calling back to Psalm 110, he's pointing to the ascended Christ who rules and reigns at the right hand of the Father and he's drawing on our union with him. Let me unpack that for just a moment for us. When we seek the things that are above, when we seek the rule and reign of Christ, we seek the coming of his kingdom. We seek his will being done on earth as it is in heaven. That translates into what should be in the church a countercultural community that should be a picture of the reality of heaven here on earth. Now, this community, this countercultural community that is built out in the church through the power of the Holy Spirit, happens through two movements. The first is putting to death what is inside. And the second is putting on what is outside of us. Verses five through 11 here begin by giving us a picture of things that are earthly in us, things that belong to our earthly nature, things that are contrary to who God is. And I think this is important for us to grasp as Christians. There are parts of who we are that are adverse to God. There there are parts of who you are in in your very being that are contrary to who God is as a person, who God is. Now, what most religions will tell you is that the problem in the world is outside of you. The problem is outside of you, but what Christianity brings to the table is what Tim Keller calls an inside-out religion. It is a problem that is inside and the solution is found outside. So here's what most religions will put before you. They will put before you an idea that if if you just go deep enough in yourself, you can find the solution to life. If you self-actualize, you fulfill your potential, you follow your passion. If you rid yourself of all of those toxic people in your life, you know, those ones that just keep dragging you down, then, And only then can you find the solution, but it's inside of you, you just have to dig deep enough. The solution is you reaching your potential and cutting out anyone who would tell you otherwise. 
But the striking claim that Christianity makes is that our relationship to God is not inside out. We don't self-actualize ourselves into a position of holiness. In fact, we have to recognize that holiness can only come from outside of us. Christianity makes this daring claim, and it's this. The problem is you. The solution is outside of you. The gospel says that you need a savior, but not only does that savior deliver you from circumstantial need, he dwells in you. Your life is hidden in him, and it is by his power that you are given a new identity. The word that we've been using, the phrase that we've been using throughout Colossians is that is, in Christ, we become truly human. So the invitation of Christianity is not to cultivate your potential, to follow your passions and desires. It's instead the invitation to chisel away all that does not look like Christ. There was a famous ice sculptor years ago who was interviewed. And he um, was asked, so how do you get from this massive block of ice to these beautiful creations that you make? And so he says, well, Let's say that I am making a horse out of ice and I chisel away everything that doesn't look like a horse. That's the invitation of Christianity is to chisel away in our lives all that does not look like Christ. So Paul begins here giving us a list of things that we are to put to death, things that do not look like Christ. We dealt with verses five and six last week, so if you're wondering what I have to say about that, you're welcome to go back and listen to our message. So I wanna turn our attention to the remaining negatives in this section of scripture. Starting in verse eight, he says this, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk. Don't lie to one another. Now this is fascinating, I think you guys will love this. The words there in the Greek just mean don't lie to one another. It's amazing. And you just write, right on the page. So anyway, that was a bad joke, all right. So you put off the old self with its practices. Now, here's the difficulty about this passage that I think is worth noting. Sin is comfortable. It is natural, and it is what we as human beings tend to lean towards. Pay attention to the words that Paul uses. He says, put to death what is earthly in you. This is not a battle that is happening outside of us. It's a, it's a battle that's raging within us. The reality of this text is the things that we are putting to death are our very selves. Now, lest you take this too morbidly, there are things in us that Paul is inviting us to put to death, but that does not mean that all of us is wrong or that all of us are things that we should put to death. You have been created in the image of God. There are certain things to cultivate within you, but the reality is, is the natural things, the natural things that we are bent towards are things that we are called to put to death. This is, I think, an area that often gets missed in the conversation about sin. Human beings are incredibly complex. And change is very difficult because what we're doing is actually contrary to who we are. Our nature would draw us towards sin. There's a a skit from many years ago where a man is having Uh, complex issues trying to change poor behavioral methods and he goes to see a therapist and the therapist's solution is simple. Just stop it. (laughs) And I think that's often how we tend to talk about these things is just, just stop. But if this is indeed something that's inside of us, I think it takes a much different approach 
Our sin is natural, flowing from the inside of our very being. Ray Ortland says this, he says, sin is as unchosen as hunger, as comfortable as sleep, as inevitable as gravity, as lethal as poison. It offers itself as an option, but takes over as a master. And so Paul's wording for how we are to deal with sin is very important. It's militant language. It's put to death the sin that is in you. Put to death the things that would pull us away from Christ. Do not take them less seriously. The temptation for us is to minimize. It was just one time, or it was just one thing, or is it really that bad? And the invitation for us from Paul here is to put to death to take it seriously. The old phrase from John Owen, be killing sin or it will be killing you. Your sin draws you away from Jesus. It does not invite you into greater relationship with him and so the invitation is to put to death. But this is difficult because it's our very nature that draws us away from Christ. It's our very nature that would call us to be different from who he is. Here's how I know that it's your nature and my nature. I was sitting with um, a man in our church a few weeks ago who shared with me, I noticed this thing was happening where every time I would scoop ice cream for my wife and I, I would scoop it first for myself. As if it was just like there wasn't gonna be enough and then he begins to share with me and I looked at the rest of our relationship and I realized that's our relationship. It's me scooping ice cream for myself. And as I, I heard this story that this man was telling me, I began to think to myself, how do I scoop ice cream? <laughs> And so I got home and you know, I was scooping ice cream for my wife and I and I realized, sure enough, who did I scoop for first? It's me. My, even in the simple thing that I was doing, my tendency was to look to self, to look out for me. And yet that, those little things tend to pervade our entire nature. But there's an invitation not only to put to death, but also to put on. Verses nine and 10 here, I think, are the the great equalizers of this entire passage. He says in verse nine, putting off the old self with its practices. And then in verse 10, and having put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. We are all, those of us in Christ, looking to Jesus, putting off what is not of him, putting to death what is not of him in us, and bringing to life, looking to him, putting on the things that are of him, being renewed in his image. This is a a side note. I I think this is really important for us. I think people would have a much easier time adjusting to Christianity if they stepped into a community where everyone's goal was to put to death the things that don't look like Jesus and to bring to life the things that do. But often what we do is we kind of, we we take behavioral sins and we put them in different categories, right? Like, well, there's this sin that's different and you know, you have a harder role of dying to yourself and I just, you know, I have a little bit of selfishness but it's not that big of a deal, you know? I probably can manage with this. It's a behavioral sin. It doesn't affect everyone around me. The invitation for all of us is to die to self, to, to put off, to put to death the things and to be renewed to look like Christ. That's what every single one of us is doing, chiseling away that which does not look like Christ. And each of us have areas in our lives that don't look like him. We are all together becoming like Christ. I've said this before as we've rolled out our mission and our vision and our values. If we get to where we're trying to go, if we accomplish the things we're trying to accomplish, 
but we don't become like Christ. We have done nothing. We won't become who we are trying to become as a people. It's in this community context of putting off, putting on, this context of all of us being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator, that where we are equally one and the same pursuing him together, all equally dwelling in Christ and Christ in us. Look at that verse 11. This, is, this would have been sacrilegious in this day and age. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. What Paul just did there is he leveled the playing field. In a church where there's division, there are those who are more spiritual than others. There are those who seem to have it all together, those who follow Jewish laws and practices more regularly than those that don't. Paul throws out this great and glorious truth. Christ is all and in all. Christ is the great equalizer. There is not Greek or Jew. That's important for us to grasp. There should not be a sort of weird spiritual maturity hierarchy among the people of God. All of us submitting to Christ, dying to self, putting off which does not look like him, growing in those things that he invites us to put on. Verses 12 through 17 takes a bit of a turn. So he makes this great equalizer statement and then steps into verses 12 and 17 where we are going to see something supernatural and unnatural happen. It's a new identity. Here in verse 12, we we see a new phrase come up, put on then. Roll down with me to verse 15, and let. If we were to go back to verse one of this chapter, seeking Christ. If we go to verse two, it's set your mind. These words, this language are things that are outside of us. These are things we are called to do, but they are not natural to us. They are outside of us. And so Paul begins this part of the letter, this put on then with these beautiful words, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Now, these words sound really nice and pretty to us. But there's something very beautiful about these words. Throughout the Old Testament, those terms, holy, beloved, God's chosen, are spoken of over the people of Israel. Those words find their fullness in Christ, who is God's holy one, who is God's chosen servant, who is God's beloved son. And now that identity gets put on the church. Paul switches this to speaking about the Colossian church. Those things which were descriptions of Christ, descriptions of Jesus, Paul switches to being also descriptions of the Colossian church. And by extension, the church universally. Our identity is so entrenched in who Christ is that while we are still in the process of putting to death and putting on Christ, this is what God says is already true about you. You are already called holy. You are already called his chosen one. You are already his beloved. Now that's important because here's the motivating factor for putting on the things of Jesus. It's not in order to get him. It's because you have him. It's not in order to find new identity. It's because you've been given new identity. And this has been Paul's, like his thrust throughout the entire letter. Your identity is in Christ. Your life is in Christ. You've been hidden in Christ. Walk in it. Live in that identity. Put on the things that are true of you. And these are what those things look like practically. A church that is walking in the character and definition of Christ is a church that is filled with compassion 
Kindness, humility, meekness, patience, they bear with one another. He calls them to forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven them. I wonder if we let, us, let that hit us the way it should. These last two, the, the bearing with one another, the forgiving each other, implies that, these last two imply something that I think we often miss. We will sin against one another in the body of Christ. We will offend. We will take things the wrong way. We will put things the wrong way. We will step on each other's toes. And we will be offended. And we will be stepped on. And we will be misunderstood. But the proof that we are in Christ is not that we never sin against one another. The proof that we are in Christ is that we forgive one another. It's that we bear with one another. Why? Because it's what the Lord has done for you. It's what the Lord has done for us. And so when we truly get that and understand that, here's the temptation. The temptation is to say, well, it's just too difficult to hang around these people. Yeah, it is. We're all Scythians and Greeks and Jews and barbarians. We all come from different backgrounds. Of course, it's hard to hang around these people. Different family cultures. But what's the invitation? Bear with one another. Forgive one another. There will be mess and there will be brokenness and there will be hurt. And that doesn't mean that the gospel isn't here. It just means that the gospel's still bearing weight on us and still working in us. And evidence of that gospel starts to become seen when we walk in forgiveness for one another, just as the Lord has forgiven us. But we live in a culture that teaches us to write off, that teaches us to cancel, that teaches us to rid your timeline of all the things that don't serve you and just fill in with your echo chamber. One of my biggest concerns about the rise of live stream technology is how easy it is to break relationship and find somebody who says the things you want to hear. Find a community that you never have to link arms with, that you never have to rub up against and get a little uncomfortable with. To just sit at home and hear a message and feel like the service has been provided and it's good enough. But the invitation is to step into a community where you will be called to walk in forgiveness and patience and bearing with one another. Yet our tendency is when somebody wrongs us to walk in making sure that they feel our pain and then to wrong them. That's natural to us. I am not an angry person, but when somebody cuts me off on the freeway, I tell you, I want them to know it. That's, isn't that why they created car horns? But what, what are we called to? In this place, our general response is not to make sure the person who offended us feels the same pain we felt. It's to bear with them. Now, lest we think this means we let anybody do whatever they want, let's keep reading the text. Above all, put on love. Whenever Paul says the words above all, I think we need to pay attention. Put on love. This is not a superficial love. If the book of Ephesians is like a cousin letter to Colossians, very similar themes going throughout them. In verses, verse four, or chapter four, verse three, Paul says, walk in the love of Christ who gave himself up for you as a pleasing aroma to God. The love that Paul is calling them to have 
is the sacrificial love of Christ seen most clearly in the death on the cross. That is not, that is not our definition of love often. In a culture that, that throws people away, the call is Christ-like love in the church. If you're feeling convicted, welcome to the club. Move on to the next section of scripture. I think that this is gonna help us. This is important. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Now this is calling back to Colossians chapter one, verse 20, where Paul says these words. He says that he made peace by the blood shed on the cross. This blood-bought peace is to rule in our hearts. Now here's the tendency when we think of peace is that we will never deal with anxiety or we will never struggle with feelings of unknown. That's, I don't think what Paul is talking about here. Let me explain why. This is not a superficial peace. It's a, it's a really important part and I think it's gonna build out what this text is saying to us. I want us to pay attention to something that's happening in the text. Verses 11, Christ is all and in all. So we have relational dynamics that have now been changed by the gospel. Then we see the invitation to forgive others just as Christ has forgiven us. Then we see love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. In a letter that's talking a lot about the reconciliation of Christ on the cross, the peace that he brokered through his death on the cross, the invitation with peace here is not an invitation to have peace, love, and happiness following hippie Jesus in a van somewhere. The invitation here is to let peace reign within the church. And peace in conflict. This is an invitation to step into reconciliate, reconciliatory peacemaking in the body. It's not void of conflict, it's pursuing true reconciliation. Here's how we know this. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body. This is not a, oh, I just feel so peaceful all the time. Everything's so quiet and relaxing. It's a I'm pursuing peace with my brothers and sisters. It's reconciliation brought about by Jesus' blood shed on the cross. So how how do we do this? So we're called to put on all of these things that are adverse to who we are in our nature and then we are now called to do something else that's adverse to our nature and let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Now lest we be confused here, or lest we argue that, well, they didn't have the same Bible that we had, that's true, but when Paul says the word of Christ, what he's talking about is the testimony of Jesus. John chapter five, verse 39, Jesus tells the Pharisees, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have life, but it is they that testify about me. They bear witness about me. So when Jesus says, let the word of Christ dwell richly, he's saying, let the Bible dwell richly in your midst. Use that word to teach and admonish one another with the wisdom of Christ. With the wisdom of Christ, which means it's a process. We we do not hit everything on the head in one conversation. We take time, we enter into relationship, we bear with one another. And then he says this, let the word of Christ dwell richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Song matters. Worship matters matters, singing matters, our songs matter. Singing is not natural to to us, but singing is the proper response to what God has done in Jesus Christ. 
And so these songs should be songs of response focused on him and thankfulness, which is the secret ingredient to Colossians. We see it all throughout this book. The secret ingredient to spiritual maturity, to walking in these things is to see Jesus and to be responding in thankfulness. Christian contentment and thankfulness is a rare jewel, but it is much easier to find when we spend our lives seeing Jesus. I think something we can miss when we come to texts like this is the corporate nature. We'll take this and individualize it. We'll say, well, I need to stop being angry. I need to stop being wrathful. I need to stop being slanderous. I need to start being humble. I need to start being meek. And I do think that that's true. So don't take this as you have no responsibility here. But I think that this text is inviting us to look towards a corporate identity more than it's looking towards a personal identity. We live in an individualistic culture, but this is a corporate invitation. All throughout this passage, the Christian walk is closely tied to a community of faith. It's why so much of the things that we're to put off and to put on have to do with our relationship to other human beings. We are not individual consumers of religious services that are offered here. We have a corporate identity And the tendency is to think, well, it's just the pastor's job or it's just the elder's job to think about what our identity is. But it's actually the body that's invited into that place. It is your job as well to think about what our corporate identity is. My um, good friend and mentor has been in town this weekend and so we've just been talking about ministry a little bit. And he shared with me something the other day. He he just said this phrase, he said, it's kind of nice sometimes when people leave the church and it's not the pastor's fault. Like somebody in the church offended them and they leave because you realize it's just not always the pastor who keeps people. Like the body has a responsibility there. So I wanna wanna do something with us real quick. I wanna close with, with thinking through this identity and then giving us the way home, the way to get to this identity. If you will, close your eyes and imagine something for me for a moment. Imagine that you walk into a church building and and at first glance you feel like, oh, this is somewhat of a nice place. They did a really good job decorating and Got some nice verses on the walls, that's good. The coffee tastes fine. You, you walk into the church and your, your first interaction with an individual is just, they seem a little ticked off, they seem a little frustrated and a little angry. They're quick tempered, you see them responding to others in that same manner and you see them actually looking down on others within the church. You Notice when situations arise, there's more than anything just planning to get revenge. There's planning to to make sure people feel the same pain. You see bickering and arguments and you see, it looks just like everything's about to boil over. They're always thinking of the next way to make somebody else hurt the same way that they've hurt. You see trash talking with others. Those that are outside the church and inside are just being demeaned and devalued and disrespected. In fact, pronouns are very derogatory now. They never use words like people, but they define them by their stance on something. And it's all to make them look like the character they're trying to tear down. And so we remove identity from people in our way of speaking about them and provide them with an identity that would make them as evil. And you're just seeing dishonesty everywhere you look and division everywhere you look. Now I want us to think on the opposite side of this. Hopefully you envision somebody else's church there and not ours, but maybe that's been your experience. 
And if so, I apologize. We will offend you. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes that's a bad thing. But now imagine, if you will, you walk into a church and your first experience is one of feeling truly welcomed. This person doesn't know me, they, they don't understand me, they've never heard my story, and yet they respond to me with kindness. They welcomed me in, but it's not, it's not superficial kindness. It's not that they welcomed me in and then behind the scenes they're talking behind my back. They're genuinely happy to see me. There. Genuinely thankful, genuinely thankful I'm here. It's pure and it's beautiful. It's the type of kindness that makes you feel truly human. You walk in and no one acts better than you. Instead, you're treated as royalty with inherent dignity, value, and worth. People are generally quick to step out in service to one another. There's patience for those who can't get their act together because people are complex and change is hard. People aren't treated as commodities or transactional relationships. Instead, there is a general response of forgiveness when complaints arise. There's a culture of peacemaking, of leaning into conflict in good faith. Everyone seems so happy and they're rejoicing and they're thankful for what God has done. And you almost wonder in the back of your head, these people can't be real. This can't be true, this, this can't be it. But they make you feel seen and loved. They make you feel welcomed and cared for. You feel like you're finally home. You can open your eyes. That's the culture I am fighting to create here. But it's not something I can do alone. That's all of us. All of us are invited into that culture. How do we do this? As I mentioned before, verse 10 and 11 are key to this passage. We as Christians are being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. We are being renewed after the image of God. Chapter one of Colossians verse 15 says that he is the image of the invisible God. Chapter one verse 19 says in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Chapter two verse nine says for in Jesus all the fullness of God dwells bodily and here the invitation for us is to look to Jesus and become like him. This is who the new creation community is now patterned after. Jesus image is God perfectly, but he also reveals to us who we were created to be. And as we look to Jesus and grow in our knowledge of him, we become more like him. You see, all these things that we are to put on are elements of who Christ is. You need to know about Jesus' compassion who like a shepherd tends to his flock, he gathers his sheep in his arms and carries them and he gently leads them. You need to know about his humility who did not account equality with God as a thing to be grasped but instead humbled himself to the point of a cross. You need to know about his meekness that he invites all who are weary to come to him and find rest for his yoke is easy and his burden is light for he is gentle and lowly in heart. You need to know about his patience who in the face of a doubting apostle doesn't move away from him but instead presents to him the nail scarred hands who in the face of doubting disciples in the midst of their worship, he does not move away from them and find other people to work with. He moves in and gives his great commission. You need to know that he bears with us, who, that Jesus, even though time and time again we see the disciples arguing over who's the greatest, his response is to prophesy his death. 
the greatest act of love known to man that leads to the forgiveness of sins. You see, in, in order for us to become a counterculture, we need to know and see Jesus for all that he is. Walk in who he is. Walk and put on in what he's called us to be. And respond in thankfulness to God our Father. Putting off the old self. Putting on the new self. Which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Seeing Jesus. Understanding who he is is how we create a culture that looks like him. We cannot do so apart from him. If there's any invitation I have for you today, it's this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly so that you can see who Jesus is and we can begin to be renewed in our knowledge of him. Let's pray. Father, we see the work before us and it is more than we feel capable of doing. And yet, you invite us to do so. So Lord, I pray that your word would dwell richly in this church. I pray that we would put off the old self, that we would take our sins seriously knowing that as a church, our sin creates a culture of people who don't look like Jesus, Lord, but we want to look like Jesus. We want to respond in thankfulness, Lord. We want to see you as the image of the invisible God. We want to walk in knowledge of you and to be renewed to look more like you, Lord. So help us. Help us to chisel off anything that does not look like you. Help us as a community of people to lean into one another, to be peacemakers. Not false peace, Lord, but peace that's blood bought. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do and all that you're going to do. We pray that you would strengthen us you would help us to see you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.